Welcome to another edition of the Default Show with Luby here on the Five Reasons Sports Network. It was a very busy week for the Miami Dolphins last week. Yes, the Heat sort of took it on the chin. Not sure what the hell happened. Went into last week, very excited about the Heat, and their last four games has been a total change of character. We're playing as good as anyone in basketball to now playing as bad as anyone in basketball. We will definitely touch on that as the week goes on. But we want to start a Monday off as we do each and every day, talking Dateline Dolphins, talking about the NFL, and the team that stole the show last week across the NFL was the Miami Dolphins. So we talk with John and Jimmy. Thank you to Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill of Key Largo about all the Dolphins' moves, what he thinks, and how he thinks it'll affect this season, and what it will do for Tua and the team as a whole. Here, the Devo Show with Lilby, Five Reasons Sports Network with John and Jimmy. Oh, uh, I could tell, man. This guy must have been, uh, what, did you get in 36 holes? Oh, John yeah, Jimmy? I mean, uh, oh, you could not, it, it was, oh. uh, he used to be the uh, chairman or the commissioner of the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce was uh, this woman named Nikki Grossman. And uh, I always think of her uh, saying, it's Chamber of Commerce weather out there. And, and it really was over this weekend. And you look like you got your share of sunshine, John. How are you, my friend? Defoe, I'm going to paint the picture for you. I felt like Jackie Gleason in a, in a Cadillac <laughs> golf cart riding around uh, Inverary back in the 70s on, yeah. on a 36-hole day because it was that glorious outside this weekend. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a blast. I had a good time on the golf course. Didn't play particularly well, but I didn't sweat a drop. Uh, had a couple cocktails and and had fun. So it, it was. I was around friends. So it was. It was a great weekend. I don't. I don't think. Uh, I don't picture you as a big Schwitzer. I mean, uh, did you sweat <laughs> no, at all like, when you were playing football? Human. No, just enough. Just enough to to get my towards going in the right direction. Sometimes you get a little off, and you need a little medication to help you hit it straight. So <laughs> that that was where I went. But but you could be like uh, you know in the PGA tour guide and 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 nobody would assume that it was a misprint. I mean uh, <laughs> you have that kind of appearance uh, like these guys. I mean they're out there and it's 112 degrees and they're playing that uh, tournament in Houston, Texas. In Austin, uh, I, I guess it comes up yeah. Yeah, yeah before like the Masters. Uh, you know. Oh so, yeah, exactly, exactly. And and the humidity is 200. percent I mean like <laughs> everybody is schwitzing their brains out. Roger Malpe. I mean uh, you know he. he he, uh, he, uh, you know, he can barely even stand up with all of that equipment that he's wearing. And, and and there's not a bead of sweat on these guys. Not one. Not one no. drop. The shirt looks perfect. The pants. I mean, and wearing slacks on top of that. Like, uh, all of a sudden, you know, they could just as easily be at a cocktail party. We we need a Craig Stadler back on the PGA <laughs> Tour just to make everybody feel better. Right? <laughs> Well, well, I mean, Stadler had an excuse, and I understand it. And, and uh, you know, the, the reference, uh, you know, is, is great because, uh, you know, remember when he got penalized at two strokes and it cost him a penalty for uh, – and, and the guy called into the TV truck and that Frank Trichinian or uh, whatever yeah. uh, was the director, big-time guy, and uh, he said, hey, wait a minute, we got to tell the rules guys about this. And uh, he had put a towel under his knee as he was trying to hit a ball from out uh, – from underneath under the tree. Under a tree, right? Yeah. Yeah. But but the truth was, he was so fat by golf uh, standards that uh, he only had one pair of pants. So he had to put the towel there because he was going to have to wear these pants the next day. You know what? Back, back so is that, that cheating? Day. I mean, that's not really cheating, John. You're you're a golfer and, you know, at the elite level. I mean, would you consider that a real violation or would you just said, go ahead, uh, Craig, put the towel down there? There are some golf rules that are really uh, bad. Bad for golf, bad for the average golfer. Uh, they're just they just don't make sense. And and all the all the tour pros and all the real professional golf elites, they always tell you, well, the the rules are there to help you. I haven't really found one that's helped me, and I don't know how many years <laughs> in the rule book of golf. But you're right that that was kind of a, a oh, weird rule wow. because it was building a stance. Yeah. Listen, Craig Statler had so many uh, lines and, and arrows and, and spots on his pants. No one would have noticed if he had a dirt spot. <laughs> you know, around the knee area, right? Uh, that's what that's that was the style in the seventies and eighties. What you wore, so uh, walrus, yeah, that, that's no. a bad rule. Bad rule. Well, you know me, uh, John, uh, having, having suffered through this a lot of my life, uh, I always root for the fat guys in sports, and, and uh, so I loved it that Stadler was a fat guy, and I always rooted for him. And, and the walrus, it turned out he was a great guy because uh, he, he had he had finished up his final round. He was kind of out of contention in the Honda Classic. All right, so that's taking place where that, that was. It was in Broward, Bent. Oh, it, it might have not, been at Weston Hills. 
Yeah, I mean, it wasn't as far up there as Palm Beach because uh, sure enough, later that afternoon, who do we run into at the track? Craig Stadler, who was in the tournament <laughs> that great. afternoon, That's and he came great. out to Gulfstream. Same outfit. And he, he, yeah, and he's just hoisting a few with the guys. So uh, I always <laughs> liked him, uh, you know, before that. And then I really fell in love with him because, I mean, oh, what a great move, huh? Straight from the golf course to the track. That's which beautiful. is, uh, I, you know, that's not necessarily your game, but I would imagine a lot of your friends. I mean, that that's the ultimate combination, you know, a little yeah. golf in the morning, straight to the racetrack to smoke a cigar and uh, try and bet some ponies in the afternoon. That's a strong move. I, I mean, I didn't, I never heard that story. That's a great story. True story. Yeah. Yeah. We ran into uh, the walrus there at the track and he was just hoisting him and having a great time at the Tiki bar out there. And, and then I saw him when he was on the champions tour, because I, I used to go up and, and do some shows uh, from the uh, tournament at broken sound mm-hmm. and uh, he's on the, on the driving range and he, he looked small. I, I don't know. Did he lose a ton of weight or was he just never really that fat? To he begin might with? have. No, he yeah. might've lost some weight, but I don't think he was ever that, that big. He was just bigger than everybody else. Yeah. Because- yeah. You had Johnny Miller that weighed 115 pounds, and then you had right. Greg Sadler might have been 200, you know, and it, it, it yeah. just looked different on TV. They all look like jockeys, these guys. Yeah. <laughs> Tall jockeys, but jockeys nonetheless. Uh, uh, all right, and, and uh, your man Scheffler is on fire. I know. What are we going to do with this master's pool, John and Jimmy? I mean, I, I don't really know. have to do some thinking. How could you possibly leave that guy off any list, no matter who else is on it? I mean, the guy's won like three of the last five tournaments, and he like breezes through this match play thing. Which, uh, what's your feeling about that? Do you like that or, or not? The match play, where you know, I the love guys... match play. Oh, I, you do. I love okay. that tournament. Yeah, I think I think the PGA Tour should have a couple of more tournaments like that because um, it really it, it brings out different strategy in golf and and how you play the golf course and how you attack the golf course, either aggressively or or by holding back because your playing partner is in trouble and you don't need to continue to make birdies, you know, where par is good sometimes or a conservative shot is better than always stepping on the gas. So yeah, Scotty Scheffler, uh, what a month he's had, right? Wow. Uh, every, every time you see, every time you see his wife now, she's got a, a better oh, outfit on because yeah, yeah. he's won another, another <laughs> tournament, right? She had a so, ring like she played for the Patriots. Uh, yeah, you know, exactly. The last one. Exactly. Yeah, it was great. Um, all right, uh, let me ask you this then in match play. Um, I mean, I would imagine there, there might have been a few bucks riding on this. Uh, you know, uh, Danny Boy certainly was flush, and, uh, you know, you, you've made your share of cash in your lifetime. Um, did you have to concede Marino absurdly difficult putts at, at different times uh, when you were lining up with him on a golf course? So, you know, he, he's got a twisting, turning 26-footer, and you, John Kajemi, you know, having to face like a, a, a treacherous downhill bender from seven feet away to win the hole. But uh, you just tell Danny before you stand over your putt. Oh, that's good, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I would. He taught me just about everything he knew. So he would never do that. So I, I try not to do that. Right. But maybe with uh, other players uh, that you feel like, OK, I'm going to give him this putt because. At the end of the day, I'm going to find a way to figure out how to win. Yeah. So you give them a putt here or there. And sometimes it comes back to bite you. But when you're playing with somebody that you know the mentality is he would never give you this putt, even if yeah. you were on your deathbed, he would say, putt it, get up and putt it. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I uh, no, I will probably wouldn't. Oh, okay. Because I figured just, uh, you know, by, by the nature of, uh, you know, the fact that, well, you know, we are talking about Dan Marino here. Well, even sometimes, though you guys are good friends. Are, uh, yeah. Sometimes it's 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 is good good go ahead pick it up if you have a similar putt but if you if if one guy's out twelve feet and another guy's in there three and a half you're gonna make that guy you know you gotta putt it I, I like uh, you know when you're playing a guy that, that is uh, so ridiculous that uh, you concede him his putt which is more difficult uh, than yours but then he doesn't give you yours and you miss it <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh yeah like, what <laughs> I gave you that I know that that's yeah. That's the worst feeling in the world. That's the one when you say all that, you know, money that's spent on modern medicine and nothing cures lockjaw, right? <laughs> you know, you got to give me the fuck, right? But he doesn't say anything. He doesn't say a word. All right, John, I, I began a show by saying uh, when we were introducing the fact that you're going to be out with Dateline Dolphins here. And uh, they got me. I was thinking about this yesterday on my walk of life. Uh, they finally got me, the Miami Dolphins. And, and uh, you know, this is after years 
uh, of just uh, like total BS that they've been feeding everybody, including the tank job of a couple of years ago. And then all this acrimony. I mean, it, it couldn't have looked any worse, uh, this Brian Flores thing. And he's pointing a finger at Stephen Ross. He's accusing him of sports bribery, for God's sake. And saying he has evidence. And this follows up all of the other bozoic things that have happened over the years. Uh, the, the failed experiments with general managers. Uh, you had uh, Mike Tannenbaum signing and Dominic and Sue and Mike Wallace. Uh, you know, just total bustology. And, and, and uh, you know, criminalizing your salary cap. In oh, terms we, of, uh, we could yeah. go on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, so many bad moves. <laughs> and they failed at the tank job. That didn't even work out like they had planned because they won a bunch of games that year. And then that created all of this, uh, you know, hostility between Flores and the organization, or at least, you know, help fuel some of that. And, and you're going back to Tony Sperano and Bill Parcells and, and all the different things that happened since Dan Marino was the quarterback here. And, and we knew every year going in, you could count on Tony Segreto picking us to win 10 games. <laughs> right? <laughs> when he did that thing before the season. Um, this time they got me, though. I mean, with Tyreek Hill, my God. And, and, and we had Tyreek Jr., Already yeah. on the roster. I mean, right. I don't know how far behind Tyreek Hill is Jalen Waddle with what he did in his rookie season. My Lord, with, with a team that was struggling through seven straight losses. And this kid just shined and came on as the season progressed, even though 17 games now for a rookie instead of 16, which is already like a giant upgrade from what they were used to playing in college in terms of stamina for the season. Uh, no wall. The guy just continues to, uh, you know, exhibit uh, amazing growth. And now you have those two guys on the field at the same time and, and, and a better offensive line. They got me, John. How could they possibly be bad this year? I, I, I don't see it. I don't see it either, to be quite honest with you. I mean, they've upgraded just about – every position you needed to upgrade on, on the offensive side of the football. And they re-signed a lot of the guys they needed to on defense. So when you take a look at this roster, it's, it's fairly complete. The only thing that you don't have synergy in uh, are the coaching staff with the players and the schemes on offense and defense, you know, defense is probably a little bit more settled because you re you, you retain Josh Boyer as the defensive coordinator. But on offense, you have a, a new head coach, a new coordinator, new position coaches, uh, basically, except for the running backs, uh, a new offensive line coach. So there's going to be some uh, working out the kinks in terms of blocking schemes, in terms of formations and motions and personnel. I think personnel is going to be the biggest change with the Miami Dolphins offense when the casual fan looks at it. Are we in three tight ends? Are we in two tight ends? Are we in no tight ends? Are we going to? Are we in motion? Uh, how many times do you have Waddle and Cedric Wilson and Tyreek Hill on the field at the same time uh, with Mike Kosicki as your quasi tight end with you know one running back? I, I think those are going to be the biggest things, and you're going to have in, in all Preston Wilson is resigned, but Devontae yes. Parker has been rumored to maybe go other places. So you don't have that alpha on the outside, but you sure are going to have trouble defending the smaller uh, smurfer sized guys that are going to be blazers. And it's not always going to be, you know, downfield with vertical routes. It's going to be a lot of picks, a lot of crossing routes where you get guys running away from man coverage or running into a zone where you can take a five yard pass and take it 75 yards for a touchdown. John's Holy Clayton and Duper, man. It's great. I mean, yeah, Luby's got one for you, honestly. but, uh, you know, a very exciting concept there right, with those two guys on the field. Well, John, and, and again, this is uh, the default show here. Just Google the default show. The Atlanta Dolphins with John and Jimmy. Thanks to Jimmy Johnson's big chill of Key Largo. What I find interesting, and it's so funny because I get default and I have talked about this. Not only Dolphin fans were negative, they've just been disinterested for so long that it's hard to get them into it. But even I had to tell people, look, you don't have to find the negative here. Like, I get it. Tyree Kill is fast. The majority of his routes aren't deep. Like, they kept showing no. highlights of Mahomes looking to the crowd and doing this down the field. That's like <laughs> one of every like 15 throws. Like the normal throws to Tyreek Hill are Tua's best throws, the slant or the screen. And Tua's so accurate that it allows his receiver to do something with it. But on top of that, the stat that people didn't realize existed, Tua actually had the best percentage of completion, completion percentage downfield. 
He just only did it 20 times. Yeah. Because when you have one second to throw, how can you get the ball down? Like, that's what people don't get. It's not that he doesn't have an arm. No, he's not Jeff George. But... And he's not Elway, but he's also not Chad Pennington when he came to the Dolphins. Like, the dude has enough arm strength. But you don't need to get that. How often do guys go down the field now? Like, down the field, this isn't the 80s with Marino. Like, it's just a different game. No, it, it isn't the, you know, the Oakland Raiders, and they used to have yeah, Daryl LeBanc exactly, exactly. bombing it down the field, right? I so, love those teams. I really I, do. Yeah, of course, they're fun. Yeah. Too. Although they, they would uh, be, I mean, arch rivals of my beloved at the time, New York Jets. Yes. Yeah. And and Pittsburgh Steelers, so yeah. they were the rivals of just about the oh yeah, the Steelers and Ra- Raiders, wow yeah. But you're right, yeah, Luby. Like I was reading a stat the other day, and I, I wrote it down. Tua uh, has the third quickest average nice. release yep. in the National Football League. It's under two point five seconds. Okay, Jalen Waddle has the third most receptions within two seconds of the snap. All right, and and Tyree Kill has the fourth most receptions within two seconds. So both quarterbacks, whether it was Tua to Jalen or whether it was Mahomes to Tyreek, they both got rid of the football to those guys under two seconds. So it wasn't just rear back, let me avoid you know two possible sacks, wave this way, and then fire it 60 yards down the field. Yeah, you had those plays, but they were far and few between of the bread and butter stuff that was quick, the slants, the bubble screens, the now, you know, uh, right off the line of scrimmage, yep. uh, just normal patterns and pick plays. Yep. Sometimes, you know, it was just a pick play on the outside that would give a guy just a, a, a body length uh, of room, of separation, and that's all you need in the National Football League. If you've got that window, the ball's coming out on time, it takes pressure off, off of your offensive line, it applies pressure to coverage and, and defensive uh, secondary. So you you have those that synergy is going to, I think, apply to this new offense and what Mike McDonald wants to do in terms of – McDaniel wants to do in, in terms of getting rid of the football, but yet running the football and being physical at yep. the line of scrimmage so you have a little bit of both. So it keeps the defense on their heels. They got me, John. Yeah, they got it's hard me. not to. Uh, <laughs> Jack and Jimmy with us here on the Defoe Show, uh, and always a pleasure. Brought to you, as uh, Luby mentioned, by Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill, uh, mile marker uh, 104 uh, in the Keys. Uh, all, all I can say, a couple of things. I mean, holy Bill James, holy Buck Showalter. Those Saber metrics were fantastic, <laughs> Jack and Jimmy. We, we don't normally dive into that kind of research uh, here on the show. Well, uh, I, I knew it would apply show, at some yeah. point on, on the show, so I wanted to write it down because I saw nice. it on, on a clip. But it just it just goes to the point that you're trying to make, Luby. It's not always have to be downfield. Yeah, you want to stretch them, yeah, okay. you know, vertically, and you're going to get those plays. But it's the simple plays. It's the it's the you know catch it in shotgun, get rid of it that keeps your offense moving in the chains. Yep. Well, and you know, you mentioned uh, Preston uh, Williams, uh, and uh, you know, unfortunately. Uh, you know, this guy had had butterfingers. I mean, hands of stone there at times, uh, and yet. I mean, he was one of those guys that uh, when he lit it up there in, in the preseason that one yeah. year, Couple and years you thought, ago. wow, I mean, eh, eh, where'd they find this guy? And uh, he hasn't really lived up to that on a consistent basis since, although showing flashes uh, here and there. But I mean, that, that, that particular receiver is going to benefit immensely, you would have to think, because uh, you're not going to be able to cover these guys. And, and then you, you were a quarterback. I mean, how great was this, whether you were playing on a sand ladder in the NFL where, where you knew you, you could throw a dump pass to a guy and, uh, you know, the guy's going to bust it for 50 yards every now and then. And, you know, you, you don't have to risk, uh, you know, throwing the ball into triple coverage and all this stuff because this guy is, has moves on top of moves at the line of scrimmage. And, and, and that's all you need, right? I mean, he gives you that little head fake one way and cuts inside and boom, yeah, the throw's there. And, and now he's on his own running running free in kind of an open secondary. It, it has to be a real luxury for a quarterback to even think about. Like, you, I would imagine you can't wait to get to the ballpark if you're Tua. Well, you, you, you're excited about going to practice every day because you're going against a really good defense. And if you're moving the football and completing passes and feel like you're handling yourself against your own defense, <sighs> it's going to be easier on Sundays. You know, going up against this defense on a daily basis and trying to figure out okay, if I'm Tua, where's the man coverage at? Because I'm going to go attack the man coverage. And if it's all zone, that's fine too. I can be patient, deliver the football on time, have some running uh, to help you out because they're, not, they're going to face a lot of teams that are going to have two safeties you know, away from 
the line of scrimmage because they're going to have to play a lot of zone against this team. They're going to need 12 men on the field, I think. (laughs) Exactly. It helps you run the football. It's going to help this team run the football just with the presence of that speed alone uh, and how they set up in different formations. When TiVo brought up two, and that's the other funny thing from last week was, now, no excuses. It's like, okay. <laughs> like, thank you. Like, oh, all the pressure's on him. Wasn't it? He got crap when he was out from injury. He got crap when he was getting hammered within two seconds. He's going to get crap regardless. Wouldn't he rather have the thoughts and the negativity with talent? I- I'm thinking if anyone's happy by these moves, it- it- it's Tua. He's not like, oh, darn it, now they gave me talent. Like, I feel like if anyone's like, oh, thank God, it's Tua. Like, good. You're going to you're gonna hate on me anyways. Now at least I have talent around me to show what I can do. Guys, it's the position of quarterback. Just look around the National Football League. I mean, do you think Russell Wilson is bad? <laughs> or, or Matt Ryan is bad. I mean, look look at all these quarterback moves. Uh, everybody's moving around, and it's all the quarterback. You always have that pressure, no matter if you're on a, a team like the Jets and you've got a rookie quarterback. They're expecting big things out of him yep. in his second year, yep. right? You yep. always have that pressure applied to the position. Tua's going to be no different. But I'd rather be Tua than the young guy in New York because look at the the talent that has been amassed and look at the defense you're playing with. And look at the home field advantage of playing at Hard Rock Stadium in September and October. Ooh. I just think that, you know, it's starting to all fall into place. It's yeah, it eight. comes down to how Tua plays. But for me, it's still how this offensive line plays. Because if, if they can improve, it's going to make everybody better. That 2.3 seconds, if it turns into 2.8 or 3.2 for Tua, that's another luxury. I think this Dolphin offense – is starting to be built and, and is built now the way the Alabama offense was built for Tua. You've, you've got better players than you're going up against. You have matchup nightmares. You can p- potentially run the football because you're going to have a scheme that's going to allow you to do it. And every, every week, you should be the favorite. I mean, except if you go against Buffalo, which that margin is starting to you know, slim a little bit on paper. You, you should have the advantage of being able to score more points in your opposition, and you've got a good defense to keep them off the scoreboard. So it's starting to match up a little bit like what Tua felt like at Alabama on paper. Now, this has to you go through the preseason and OTAs and get ready for the regular season. But, you know, you go out and get Armstead at tackle, you know, you're crossing your fingers he's going to be able to make it through the whole season. That, that's probably the, the biggest concern of the offensive line. You go get Williams from Dallas. That locks up the left side of the offensive line. Now you got a battle royale on the right side because you got Robert Hunt and hopefully Liam Eikenberg that can step over and play in his second year and feel like those guys are good. Now, I haven't mentioned Austin Jackson, who was <laughs> your first reason. round job choice from a couple years ago. You know, is he morphed into what Jesse Davis was going to be? I can play right tackle, I can play left tackle, I can play left guard, I can play this. You know, you, you need a guy like that. But as a first round draft choice, you don't want a guy like that because you're admitting you failed. So maybe he's not around. I don't know, but yeah. this offensive line should be better because of the oh. additions they made in, in free agency. Well, and, and uh, you know, it, it's like uh, you can have uh, one sort of missing link, but, but you have improved at 40% yeah. of the offensive line positions. Uh, you know, there, there's only five, there are only five players up there and, and two of them are real good that you just acquired in free agency. We know that. And, uh, you know, as you mentioned, uh, people are always high on this Robert Hunt guy. Every time I see him, he's limping off the field. But, uh, you know, he's <laughs> it, supposed to be very good. <laughs> so I, I've actually zeroed in on him a few times. I, I guess, uh, you know, it shows more promise well, he, than the average Dolphin offensive lineman. I think so, there's going to be competition up there. You've got yeah. Kinley. You've got Jones. You've probably got a couple other guys that are on the roster. No I haven't looked. Guys. Yeah, you're going to probably draft another guy or get another guy that's an undrafted free agent that are, you know, all of a sudden, this guy from Middle Tennessee State is going to be, you know, the, the answer at right tackle. You're going to find guys like that, you know, not only in the draft this year, but guys that don't get signed that all of a sudden you keep around the roster and two years later, he's your starter. When, when you have two guys that are good at their job, doesn't it make everyone else's job easier? Doesn't allow, like if Hunt was solid last year with garbage around him, wouldn't he be even better with two guys where it's like, okay, good, we don't have to worry about that. They don't need help. Doesn't that make everyone else's job easier and doesn't that make them better in a sense? Well, I think with the change in offensive line coach, change in head coach and philosophy on offense, 
to more of a zone running scheme. I, I think it's getting those guys to work as one. I, I think it's going to take repetition and OTAs and training camp to be where you want to be. But I, I think just the scheme alone is going to take some pressure off of a, a man, uh, you know, man against man trying to move a guy against his will where you have the scheme that works together in unison and, and that and the speed at running back, which they've acquired, I think will help yeah. tremendously. You get Chase Edmonds and you get Mostert. You know, Mostert. So you've got guys that are blazers that can hit a hole and get through the other side of it. So you only need a small crack. And if that offensive line is, is playing in that zone scheme, maybe it helps out that running game that much more. We need to bring back Joe Philbin, the coach. <laughs> no, no, uh, God. Saw some clips of him. I, I forget what team he's with now, but uh, like Dallas. I, you know surprisingly, he, he was the, the antithesis of the Joe Philbin that we no. knew as a head coach. He was like cursing and swearing, <laughs> and uh, you know, I looked like one of the real old school guys. You know, that was coaching O line in the fifties. He, he was great, but uh, you know, and, and I also like. I mean, this all maybe it happened by you know circumstance or uh, almost uh, you know blind luck or mistake but but I, I like the fact we have this sort of uh savant uh, of a coach yep, who's yep. Uh, quoting julie you know could be khalil jabran and uh, <laughs> you know uh, talking about you know how he's going to make everything flow um uh, and and he seems like maybe you know he, he's the right guy to uh, put that thing together you know as opposed to some uh, old school hardline guy that uh, was going to go by a lot of conventional stuff i mean you have all of this freak talent now uh, that you can uh, go ahead and exploit. So uh, I, I'm in. Uh, you know what, John? They got me. I'm, I'm going to go Segreto and say they go uh, no wins. less than 11 and 6. Yeah, exactly. I think the over-under number is 11 for the Dolphins. Something is that like what that. it is right wow, now? Is it really I, at 11? He's 10 and a hook. I think he's 10 and a hook. <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, the AFC but then, you have to factor in that it's an extra game, though. You know, so yeah, I mean, that's obviously true. that number I mean, is AFC, not as staggering as it might have. The AFC is insane. The, like every good quarterback's in the AFC yeah. right now. Like, it's gonna be. It's gonna be. Yeah, you want to go through the schedule road. and you know Honestly. see what games we think they're gonna win and lose. <laughs> I always love doing it. Oh, it, it's great when you look back and go, "How could I be so stupid?" How, well, how no, I, I mean we have no idea who's gonna show yeah, up. No, no. You know, like it, it always amazes me. Tony, poor Tony, used to have to do that on the news. You remember? Yep. And, uh, you know, the schedule would come out and he'd have to, you know, they, they would go, OK, the war in Ukraine is escalated to the point where uh, we're almost ready to push the nuclear button. But uh, here's Tony Segreto. The Dolphin schedule came out <laughs> <laughs> and he would go through all of the games. They'd go like, uh, yeah, Buffalo, we're going to win that one. Uh, Jets uh, at all. Yeah, we got that one to an O. And you're like, how the hell would you know? I mean, <laughs> I know. I do that every year, though, Defoe. I do of it course. Every yeah. Year. Always, yeah. yeah. You know, before, always do before the season this past year uh, at Channel 4, we had to have our picks. So That's, Kim Bo and myself, yeah. and uh, I think it was Mike Cuno. And before we go live, everybody's, you know, hey, what are you picking? You know, want, we want to build a graphic. You know, the producer and the director in the, in the studio, what do, what do you want? So yeah. I think Mike Cuno said uh, the Dolphins are going to be twelve and you know, of whatever course. it was. Yeah. Wow, uh, going to say they're going to be Kim like six and had ten, a, yeah. eleven <laughs> wins, and I and I said nine. Yep. And they were nine. like, we can't put uh, we can't put that up there. <laughs> we <laughs> can't put we <laughs> can't put that up there. And I said, what kind of clown really, are you, can, Jimmy? I was <laughs> saying, I was really thinking eight, exactly. but I wanted to give the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to give nine. Yeah. I yeah. Love that. So they finally convinced me that I had to go double digits because they were oh, 12, Jesus. 11. So I put right. ten up there, but I didn't oh. believe it. I didn't believe it. See, yeah, and that that's just wrong, right? They they that's hire right. you for your expertise. You hit the number right on the head, and nobody would have figured they that when they it. were one and seven. You would have right. thought, wow, nine wins, absolutely impossible. But, uh, you know, the fact that these other guys were just flat out shilling for the Dolphins is, is you know, the yeah. kind of thing that unfortunately, you know, it makes that whole exercise worthless. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Tony used to have them no worse than ten and six every year in the Never. sixteen game season. Never. So, uh, <laughs> but I, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say. I like uh, Luby mentioned, and uh, you were saying the AFC this year has uh, you know well, any number of really really good teams. Huh? No matter how good the Dolphins are on paper, they have to figure out a way to split with the Bills if they're going to make the yep. playoffs. Yep, yep. Okay. Yep. Even if you sweep, even if you sweep New England and the Jets. Yeah. You have to find a which way is no guarantee, no, no, which no. is no guarantee, right? Yeah. yeah no so you have it. to figure out one win against the Bills may get you over yep. the hump. If they yep. go zero and two again next yeah. year, no matter how many how the games shake out, yep. they're going to be a game short. You got to beat the Bills once. 
You would think. I mean, they're, they're gearing up for it. I, I, I believe that, that Tua's skills Tua will be enhanced be greatly by, by the lineup mm-hmm. that they have uh, because he sort of uh, would appear to have, uh, you know, a certain amount of symmetry with this type of lineup. Where, where, you know, you need to get the ball quickly to a guy. You, you know how this is, John, having played a position. Uh, you know, people always thought, even if you're playing recreational uh, football, right, uh, you, you would think, hey, you don't have to wait till I'm 30 yards down the field exactly. to throw a long pass. I mean, the second I have a step on a guy, I want the ball delivered. And, and, and two is good at that. I mean, you know, he, he seems like he could really get acclimated to the idea that, uh, you know, if he looks one way and, and then looks back, I mean, you're looking at either Tyreek Hill or, or Waddle. And, and then, you know, Jasicki uh, is, is a five. Of, that guy seemed to have a real chemistry with Tango yes. Bailoa last year, uh, even though the circumstances were obviously far more adverse. Well, Kasiki's catch radius is so large, you can get it close to him, no matter if it's in man coverage or zone coverage, and you're going to get a reception. I think the other way of looking at it is what you're talking about, getting rid of the football quickly. These guys are so fast in and out of breaks that they create the separation that is required in the National Football League. There's not a lot of guys running wide open. Very rarely, unless it's a busted coverage, do you see guys running free in the National Football League. It's always a tight tight window to deliver the football, and you have to be accurate with your ball location – and, and to a, that accentuates what he does well, right? Get rid of the football, put it in a location where your guy can get it and not only catch it, but run after catch. Yep. That's what you're going to see with, you know, Tyree Kill, Jalen Waddle, Cedric Wilson. Those guys make plays. They make yards after the catch. And that's going to be pivotal in this offense. It's not the big plays down the field, but it's going to be the medium to intermediate plays that are made. And how many, how many times can you see him break a tackle? or continue out of a route around the defender and just go down the sidelines for big yard. And you have to love it if you're a quarterback uh, when you have guys that also, in addition to being able to create plays like that, uh, can wrestle the ball away yep. in tough spots. I mean, all of those guys are really good at that. Uh, I, I just, you know, Tyreek Hill is very good at, at winning those wrestling matches when uh, he is covered and he comes down with the ball like our good friend O.J. McDuffie did for many years for your That's man, right. Dan Marino, where, you yeah, know, yeah. there are three guys yep. around him, but who comes down with the ball? Your just, guy. Yep. Yeah. And, and, you know, you, you can take a few chances uh, there and, you know, that makes a big difference, turns bad plays uh, into good ones. Uh, Luby would refuse to admit this, but uh, Julian Edelman was yeah, extremely was good at that. At that. Yeah, oh, yeah. Really yeah. Great. Absolutely. Including that play in a Super Bowl, which is one of the most remarkable game-saving catches, uh, even yeah. though it wasn't ultimately the winning play. Man, did that, remember that one? There were like four guys, yeah, the ball the came off his shoe, off his nose, went up in the air, and hit a yeah. sprink, uh, sprinkler system and <laughs> shot up there like a geyser, and it came down, and somehow with three guys all around him while he was on the ground, he comes up with the ball. And, and uh, those uh, those Dolphin receivers have that, and, and any team that has that, uh, Cooper Cup, you know, is yep. one of those guys yep. that always yep. wins those wrestling matches. And so uh, to have a few of those guys on your roster as opposed to just a bunch of guys that uh, look like they uh, dip their hands in baby oil is, uh, you know, a a real luxury, I I would think. As I talked with you last week about it, I was very in on all the moves the Dolphins made. Defoe, who's Mr. Skeptic, was also in to see the Dolphins get a lot more setting on offense without hurting themselves on defense at all. Had one of the top five or so defenses in all of football. Kept that. Kept their defense coordinator had an offense that was bereft of talent and now seem to have talent everywhere and have a young coach who's by many known as an offensive guru, a savant, people have called, especially with run games, and he's all in on Tua. Seems like the Dolphins are doing the things they need to do to move forward. John Jimmy, who's been a Finn sider for years, worked with CBS4, covers the Dolphins, and he's had some questions when it came to the run game. Always well, happy with the moves they made there. Uh, the offensive coaching, he's happy with... McDaniel and some of the moves they made there. And Tua, he's a guy who's had a lot of faith in him, but has said he hasn't had the help. Well, now believes that Tua does have that help and that the Miami Dolphins are trending in the right direction. Yeah, the AFC is going to be tough, but the Dolphins have made moves, the kind of moves you need to make to surround your young quarterback and really contend in that conference and at least make them more of a make them more of a contender in the AFC East. I'm excited. He was excited. And even John Jimmy is excited. So looking for big things for the Miami Dolphins, of course. We'll talk more about the Miami Heat and whatever the hell's going on there. They've totally just hit the skids. The Celtics were out of the playoffs like a month and a half ago, two months ago. And now they're the number one seed. The Heat have been the number one seed for most of the season. Now they're number two. And if they keep playing like this, they'll be number four or five. 
Hopefully the Miami Heat figure it out. We'll talk more about that. And, of course, those Dolphins, this has been the Defoe Show with Luby right here on the Five Reasons Sports Network. Recently, we realized it's not just hurricane season that can hurt us. Any time of year, things can happen to your home or business. And the insurance company can be your friend, but they also can be your enemy. Horizon Public Adjusters, Justina Testa, are here for you to help this process go so much easier. Before you call the insurance company, call Horizon Public Adjusters and Justina Testa at 954-809-8752. Would you go into court without an attorney? So why would you go up against an insurance company without Horizon Public Adjusters and Justina Testa? Seven to ten times more money recovered with a public adjuster than if you went on your own. If there's no recovery, there's no fee, give them a call at 954 809 8752. Why go up against insurance companies alone when you can have Horizon Public Adjusters and Justina Testa on your side? Hey, folks, Tony Segretto here. You know, since day one, Catholic Health Services has been part of old school. And since we've started letting people know about them, it's changed their lives. You see, Catholic Health Services, while being recognized as one of the top places for stroke rehab in the country, it's also about a group of people who not just excel in what they do, from the doctors to the nurses to the therapist, on and on and on. It's how they do what they do every single day that separates them from the pack. They do it with a passion, unmatched, and the inclusion of family in every step of the process. Trust me when I tell you this. If you want the best unmatched rehab with a special group of skilled, caring people, there is truly only one place, and that one place is Catholic Health Services.